Chapter 32 this morning, please. Verse number 22. Deuteronomy 32, verse 22. The infallible text says, For a fire is kindled in mine anger, and shall burn unto the lowest hell, and shall consume the earth with her increase, and set on fire the foundations of the mountains. Lord, anoint Your Word as it goes out. Our Heavenly Father, help me break it this morning. Break the bread and put it out here. Heavenly Father, cast it upon the waters. Send it out as the rain cometh down and the snow from heaven. And water the earth it may bring forth in bud and give seed to the sower and bread to the eater. So shall Thy Word be that goeth forth out of Thy mouth. It shall not return unto thee void, but it will accomplish that which you please, and it will prosper in the thing whereto you have sent it. So it be done in Jesus' name. Amen. You can be seated. All it takes is a simple search on Google, and you'll pull up many, 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 many references to the fact that there is no such thing as hell, and that they, uh, they, they go to great lengths to tell you that the word Sheol, that's translated hell and grave and pit in the Old Testament, only means the grave. And so this morning I want you to turn to the book of Genesis chapter 35 and verse number 20 with me, please. Let's have just a little bit of a Bible study. Genesis chapter number 35, verse number 20. Genesis 35, 20. And Jacob set a pillar upon her grave. Her, referring back to verse 19, Rachel died, was buried in the way to Ephrath, which is Bethlehem. And Jacob set a pillar upon her grave, that is the pillar of Rachel's grave to this day. The grave is Keborah. That's the Hebrew word, Keborah. Keborah is never found anywhere in the Old Testament to make reference to this unseen state of the dead. It always refers to to a grave, a physical grave. Now look at the book of Genesis, Numbers rather, chapter 19 and verse number 16. I'm going to give you just two illustrations. There could be many, but for the sake of time, we're going to try to move along with this. But look at Numbers chapter 19 and verse 16. And whosoever toucheth one that is slain with a sword in the open fields, or a dead body, or a bone of a man, or a grave shall be unclean seven days. The Hebrew word kever. Kever is translated grave here. Kebora, a grave, a physical grave. Kever, a physical grave. There's another word that is translated grave in the Old Testament, and that is sheol. And I'm sure you've heard about sheol many times from people who deny that there is a, a hell. The King James translators and many others, when they got to the word sheol, by reading the context of it and knowing something about Jewish history and the Word of God, on many occasions when they came to the word Sheol, they would translate it grave. But on just as many other occasions when they'd come to that word, they were forced to translate it hell. Because grave, like Kiver or Kabora, would no way would it fit what it's talking about. So the word in the Old Testament comes to mean the unseen state of the dead. It's where they go that you can't see them, but you know that there's more going on than what happens with the grave. So when a man stands up and tells you that the word Sheol only means grave, he's one of two things. He's personally completely ignorant and deceived and knows nothing, or he is a deceiver himself with an agenda who intends to deceive you. He's what we call a hell denier. I don't take any pleasure in that. I don't enjoy the doctrine of hell. If I had anything to do with it, uh, I wouldn't be the one writing that in Scripture, but I'm just a man. I didn't write that. That was here a long time before I ever showed up. But now that I've lived almost 72 years in this world, and I've watched the way people treat each other, and I've learned a little something about human nature... I could say to you that hell is a deserving place at the end of a Christ-rejecting life. There's a man in this country just a few days ago that stood up and oh how he put on a show because his wife and two children were gone and were missing. And then come to find out the man is a murderer. He murdered his wife and he murdered his two children. 
Where do you think he ought to go? The only place, my friend, that's left for him is hell. And the only one that can keep him out of hell is the Lord Jesus Christ. That's the only one. And if he never meets the Son of God in this world, then he'll go to hell. He won't go to Kiver or Kaborah. That's where they put his body. But he's a whole lot more than the body. You see, the Bible is very clear about things like this. And in this generation that we live in today, it's such an arrogant smart aleck, know-it-all generation that completely throws the Bible out as if to say, we are so much smarter than you or your grandfather or your great-grandfather. Oh, what an arrogant, ignorant bunch that we live in today. These men, my friend, that translated this Bible, the Hebrew word is Sheol, in hell half as many times as they did grave. And then three times they translated it pit. Three times Sheol is translated as pit. Why pit? Because hell is a pit. It is a pit. So then preacher, you say to me that you believe in hell. You better believe I do. I heard one of the big, big mega church pastors say not too long ago, he said, well, he said, it's not, it's not my place to get up in the pulpit and tell people about hell. My place is to give them a positive message and to show them what all God can do for them. Let me explain something for you today. I'm here today and I'm gone tomorrow. My opinions and my attitude toward this Bible are meaningless. What does the book say itself? What saith the Scripture? You're not going to be held accountable for preaching. Lawson, you're going to be held accountable for the Word of God. When the rich man lifted up his eyes in hell and Abraham talked to him, he said, listen, they have Moses and the prophets. And they have Moses and the prophets. If they'll not listen to them, they'll not listen to one, though he came back from the dead. Now this has been on me for some time. I've got to tell you about hell today. Some of you sitting in this house right now, this preacher, and some of you that are watching this thing live right now over the internet, and some of you that are watch it later, you're headed for hell. You are headed straight to hell. And nothing can stop that but the Lord Jesus Christ. In 1900 B.C., in the book of Job, chapter 11 and verse number 8, the Scripture says, It is as high as heaven. What canst thou do? Deeper than hell. What canst thou know? In Job 26 and verse 6, 1,900 years before Christ, in other words, almost 4,000 years ago, Hell is naked before Him, and destruction hath no covering. I am reading to you Moses... And the prophets. This is what they said in hell. They said they have Moses and the prophets. And that's what I'm talking to you about this morning, dear friend. I'm reading from Moses. Deuteronomy chapter 32, verse 22, that I opened up this message with this morning is straight from the Pentateuch. The first five books of the Bible, which dated 1,400 B.C. 3,400 years ago, the Pentateuch, Moses wrote about hell. In Psalm chapter 9, verse 17, The wicked shall be turned into hell, Sheol, and all nations that forget God. 1,000 B.C. This runs throughout, the, it has a thread that runs all through the Old Testament. It doesn't start somewhere, changes its meaning, and is embellished later. The same principle that starts in Deuteronomy runs all the way through Malachi. It's as consistent as it can possibly be. And the reason for the consistency Consistency is because it is the Word of God. It is God's revelation to us at what lies beyond the grave. You take comfort from the fact that you live your life as you please and die like a dog that's all over with and so you vanish into, into oblivion. You got that from Darwin because Darwin told you that your life is meaningless. Darwin told you that you came from nothing and have no purpose in this world. That's what Darwin told you. And you bought the lie. You believe Darwin. And you've taken the Bible and thrown it out there. Won't you read the Bible? Why don't you prayerfully just say, Lord, if this is your word, I'm going to read what this preacher quoted, and you tell me if it's right or wrong. Read the word of God for yourself. The Bible says in Psalm chapter number 86 and verse 13, Great is thy mercy toward me, and thou hast delivered my soul from the lowest Hell. Proverbs chapter number 9. Turn there with me to verse 13. Proverbs 9, 13. Look at this scripture. Proverbs chapter number 9, verse 13. 
A foolish woman is clamorous, she is simple, and knoweth nothing. For she sitteth at the door of her house, on a seat in the high places of the city, to call passengers who go right on their ways. Whoso is simple, let him turn in hither, and as for him that wanteth understanding, she saith unto him, listen to this, listen to this, Stolen waters are sweet, and bread eaten in secret is pleasant. Nothing's changed, has it? See how she entices him? So you see how she lays sin before him and said, It's got pleasure in it. And it does. The Bible said there's pleasure in sin for a season. And she entices him. She tempts him by saying to him, Stolen waters are sweet, and bread eaten in secret is pleasant. But he knoweth not that the dead are there, and that her guests are in the depths of hell. You see that? That's as plain as it can be. What is this preacher? This is an ignorant young man being drawn in by a prostitute. And this is what happens to him in the book of, Psalm, in the book of Proverbs chapter number 9. That her guests are in the depths of hell. You think that's the grave? <laughs> I mean, if you read this Bible for a while, look at Isaiah 5.14. Therefore hell hath enlarged its, herself and opened her mouth without measure, and their glory and their multitude and their pomp, and he that rejoiceth shall descend into it. Now you think that's the grave? Isaiah 14, 9. Hell from beneath is moved for thee to meet thee at thy coming. It stirreth up the dead for, ye, for thee, even the chief ones of the earth. It hath raised up from their thrones all the kings of the nations. Isaiah 14, 15. Yet thou shalt be brought down to hell to the sides of the pit. In Isaiah 14, we're talking to Lucifer. Lucifer is a spirit being. Lucifer, the light bearer. It's a Latin word. The light bearer, the imitation of Christ, the false Christ, the pseudo Christos. And in Isaiah 14, we're talking about him. And God says, I'm going to bring you down to hell. Do you think that the grave is a receptacle for a spirit being? It's as plain in Isaiah as it can be. Ezekiel chapter number 31 verse 16, I made the nations to shake at the sound of His fall when I cast Him down to hell with them that descend into the pit. The Apostle Peter talks about a place where there's mist and darkness forever. I can't explain that. It's just simply believe it. I can't explain all of what makes up hell. I can't give you a, 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 a personal uh, you know, tour through hell. But I can tell you this, I believe it. I believe it. And I believe that it's a pit. And I believe this. I believe I don't want to go there. I don't want to go to hell. I mean, if I, if, I, if I had accomplished everything the earth has to accomplish, made all the money that you can make in the world, and I mean, everybody wanted to hear everything I had to say, and I was the greatest thing that lived, and died and went to hell, what would it profit me? What would it profit you if you gained the whole world and lose your soul and go into hell? If you had all the money in the world, it wouldn't buy you one moment of peace in hell. It wouldn't buy you one drink of water in hell. There's nothing for sale, for sale in hell. Nothing, nothing's on, no, there's no, there's no, uh, there's no sales in hell. In the book of Jonah, chapter number 2 and verse 2, and said, I cried by reason of mine affliction to the Lord, and he heard me out of the belly of hell, cried I, and thou heardest my voice. The Lord Jesus quotes this in the New Testament. And he said, Jonah was in the heart of the earth. Heart of the earth. How in the world could that be a grave when he said he was in the heart of the earth? Jonah, typically and with symbology and physically, went down spiritually into the place called hell. God pulled him out of it. Amen. Now we come to the book of New Testament. We come to the New Testament. The liberals love the Sermon on the Mount. That's all you hear out of them. The Beatitudes. The people hear it Sunday after Sunday after Sunday till it's up to here. They've been blessed so much and loved so much they think they're the greatest thing in the world. They are. They think they are. So much. Yet the same Sermon on the Mount has some of the most biting scriptures about hell in the Bible. It doesn't get more graphic than what Christ said at the Sermon on the Mount. Matthew 5.22 I say unto you, 
that whosoever is angry with his brother without a call shall be in danger of the judgment. But whosoever shall say to his brother, Raka, shall be in danger of the council. But whosoever shall say, Thou fool, shall be in danger of the grave. Doesn't make sense, does it? It's ludicrous. It's stupid. It's ignorant. What did he say? He said, Thou fool, shall be in danger of what? Hell fire. That's clear. The word translated hell here is Gehenna. Gehenna is the valley of Hinnom, the valley of the son of Hinnom. It's on the southern slope of Jerusalem. You can go back in ancient Jewish history and find that there was a time in the past it was a pleasant valley. A pleasant place. It was a place where they built their gardens. It was a beautiful place. The valley of Hinnom. They don't know where the the name started somewhere in the ancient past. But the valley of Hinnom had always been there. But when Solomon brought idolatry into Israel, he brought the worship of Moloch, which was the Ammonite god. And with that he brought child sacrifice into the country. What a horrid thing that man brought into Israel. God help us. Solomon is not one of my heroes. And what he brought into that country, he brought the death, the sorrow, and the destruction of the children. They say that they would lay the babies into the arms of Moloch. And they would beat their drums while that baby rolled off into that burning fire alive. And they could hear it screaming as that little thing was being sacrificed to this piece of garbage. To this pagan garbage. All religions are garbage outside the Lord Jesus Christ. It's all the road to death and hell. Folks, there is no compatibility and dialogue between Christ and the other gods. He's either the Lord God and there's nothing beside Him, or He's nothing today. Amen. There is no place with Christ on the stage and Buddha on the stage and Confucius on the stage and Mohammed. No, friend. There is no other name under heaven given among men whereby we must be saved. And so they beat the drums while they offer their babies under this piece of garbage, this man-made garbage. But what happens is that it becomes a place of death and sorrow and dying. It became a place where it was horrible. The Bible said under the reign of Josiah. And Josiah was a young man who became the king of Judah. And when Josiah became the king of Judah, the word of God had been laid aside in the temple somewhere. Somewhere. And the Bible said that Hilkiah the priest found the scroll of the law of God. And he found that scroll and he brought it out and he read it to Josiah. And when he read it to Josiah, he lost it. He said, no, woe is me. My country doesn't live by this word. And Josiah was very upset. He reinstituted the Passover. He brought Israel back in a right relationship with God. He tore down the altars and the high places. And he brought revival to the land. And then the Bible said he defiled the valley of Tophet. He defiled Hinnom. And if we read a little closer into it, you'll see where the Bible says that he took bones and he piled them up in this valley. And so from that day on, from the time of Josiah, it became a place of the valley of slaughter, they called it. And they buried, they carried, they car- the mortifying, the, the bodies that were rotting, and they carried them, then they burned them. And it literally became the sewage collection of Jerusalem. And 2,000 years ago at the time of Christ, he looked at that and he said, That, that's it. See the destruction, see the death, see the sorrow. That is what hell looks like. And the Greek word Gehenna is is a reference to hell. And that is a picture of it. And the Greek word Hades is another reference to hell. And the Greek word Tartarus is another reference to hell. Gehenna, Tartarus, and Hades. These are three Greek words in the New Testament that are translated hell. Tartarus is translated the lowest hell. And that's where the angels that kept not their first estate. The New Testament Hades is essentially the equivalent of the Old Testament Sheol. It is the unseen state of the dead. Where do they go? What happens to them when they die? Well, preacher, they just die like a dog. You know that, don't you? How did you come to that great scientific conclusion? Say, there's nothing left after the grave. All you got's a body. Where'd the life go? Do you even know what life is? Define it for me. Put it under a microscope and tell me what life is. Tell me what a spirit is. Give me the essence of a spirit. Would you do that? Have you ever thought about that? I've thought about it. I think about it in the late hours of the night, friend. 
I think a lot about what makes up a man. Do you know what a spirit is? When Maurice Rawlings brought that man back to life, he was terror on his face. Maurice Rawlings is a cardiologist in Chattanooga. And he brought that man back. He was on a treadmill and that man suffered a heart attack while he was working with him. Yeah. And boy, I'm telling you right now, that cardiologist finally brought him back. And when he did, that man was screaming, don't let me go. Don't let me die. Don't let me. I'm burning. I'm in hell. I'm in hell. I'm in hell. Yeah. And the doctor didn't believe him at first. And then finally prayed a little prayer with him to keep him out of hell. And the prayer was what he said he'd learned in Sunday school. Maurice Rawlings, this world-renowned cardiologist. He's cardiologist that treated Dwight David Eisenhower and some of the biggest names in the country, well-known, well-respected. He said, I went home and dusted off my Bible. And he said, I got right with God. And he said, I prayed a prayer with that man on the, on that, uh, that was having this terror. And he said, I just said, well, you call on Jesus and ask Jesus to save you and ask Jesus to help you. And he said, that's what the man did. The man quit screaming. <laughs> that got the doctor. He's a smart man. Maurice Rawlings a very smart man. And he knew he was dealing with something that his textbook didn't tell him anything about. <laughs> Nothing wrong with his textbook. Thank God for a good cardiologist. Nothing wrong with that. But the textbook is not about your soul. Found out there's a whole lot more going on. So what did the Lord Jesus do? He warned them, brother. The Son of God is warning people. Matthew 23, verse 33. You serpents, you generation of vipers, how can you escape the damnation of the grave? Doesn't sound right, does it? Doesn't make a lick of sense, does it? What does he say? How can you escape the damnation of what? Hell. Hell, Luke 12, verse 5. I will forewarn you whom ye shall fear. Fear him after he hath killed, hath power to cast into hell. Yea, I say unto you, fear him. You know who said that? Caiaphas didn't say that. Judas Iscariot didn't say that. You know who said that? The Lord Jesus Christ said that. Do you realize, folks, that in all this Bible, all 66 books, Spanning a period of thousands of years, nobody ever walked this earth that preached more specifically and descriptively of hell than Christ. Amen. Nobody. Nobody even came close. So for you to stand up and say you're a Christian and deny the existence of hell is to say to the Lord Jesus Christ, you're crazy, and I just push you out of the side. Dismiss you. I just dismiss you. Then to Luke chapter 16. The Bible said, In hell he lifted up his eyes, being in torments, and seeth Abraham afar off, and Lazarus in his bosom. Luke 16, 23. That's awful. And it's graphic. For in Luke 16 he talks about how that he's tormented in these flames, that he'd like to have a touch, just a little water to, to touch his tongue. For he is, for he is, for he obviously is thirsty, and he's burning. He's tormented in flames. He's in hell. 2 Peter chapter number 2 and verse number 4. For God spared not the angels that sinned, but cast them down to hell, delivered them into the chains of darkness, and we reserved to judgment. Chains, angels, carried them down. They're in Tartarus, the lowest hell. There they're bound. So what kind of a chain, same chain that you'll find in Revelation 9, where an angel comes down and chains that, that, uh, that uh, Satan. <laughs> chains. Same chain you find in the Bible. Chapter, four, chapter 20 of Revelation, verse 14. And death and hell were cast into the lake of fire. This is the second death. Have you really ever thought about that? I think about it all the time. I got on my knees last night before I get up to preach this this morning. I said, Lord, I've done everything I know to do. I believe in You. I call on Your name. I know You saved me. But I fear hell because I fear God. I fear Him. I fear Him. I fear God. If you'll get a good healthy fear of God, it'll keep you out of a lot of trouble. <laughs> it really will. It'll keep you out of a lot of trouble. And, we're, and, and we have a proclivity for trouble, don't we? 
We have a propensity for trouble. I mean, it's just our nature to wander astray and to get off where we shouldn't be and to mess up and do things we shouldn't be doing. That's our nature. By nature, we're children of wrath. It takes, it takes somebody higher than us to get us right. It takes the work of God, the, the work of Christ on the cross to cleanse us. That gets us right with God. There's no way to be right with God except through the Lord Jesus Christ. That's the only way, folks. And so here in Revelation 20, he said, And death and hell were cast into the lake of fire. This is the second death. You say, then that sounds like there's something worse than hell. The lake of fire, folks. My goodness gracious. Hebrews 12, 29 says this. Our God is a consuming fire. And that's a quotation of the Old Testament. He's quoting the Old Testament. Where it says, Our God is a consuming fire. Boy, He loves us. He wants to bring us to where He is. And in order to do that, He came to where we are. And in order to communicate with us, He had to become one of us. In other words, the Son of God became a man. God became a man and walked among us for 33 and a half years. Otherwise, forget trying to communicate with God. Forget trying to even draw close to Him. Forget it, because just His glory would consume you. But here it says He's a consuming fire. I marvel at how that we've reduced God to our little pea brains. If we don't have the power to do it, then surely God's got, he's, you know, he's locked up too. I mean, that's just too big a job for him. Is there anything too great, too big for the Lord? No. No. Nothing. Hebrews 10, 31. It is a fearful thing to fall into the hands of the living God. That's one we ought to memorize, you know it. And memorize that with John 3.16. For God so loved the world and gave His only begotten Son, whosoever believed Him should not perish, but have everlasting life. Isn't that wonderful? Did you know where I learned that verse of Scripture? I always love to tell people this. I learned that at Beaumont Grammar School. (laughs) Beaumont Grammar School is a public school over there on Beaumont Avenue. And I think it was my fourth or fifth grade teacher. We learned that Scripture in class. Well, that's awful, wasn't it? Wasn't that awful? Just think about religion being brought in the classroom. But you know something? I can't remember one time when I went to school all the way through the 12th grade that anybody ever got shot to death. The Bible said when the wicked rule, the people mourn. I'm getting away from my text. <laughs> I get aggravated with them. We'd get up and read Scripture and we'd sing and we'd, we'd, we'd pledge allegiance to the flag and we had George Washington and Abraham Lincoln and all of them on the, on the walls around the pictures of it. They taught us patriotism when we went in there and all that, you know. And that's, that's what I learned in school. Now what do they get? <laughs> it's a shame. Fearful thing to fall into the hands of the living God. You don't want to do it, folks. Listen. You, I, I'm nothing. I can't judge you. I have no power to send you to heaven or hell. Don't ever let some man wave something over your head and condemn you as if to say he can determine where your future is going. No, he can't. The Lord Jesus Christ makes the difference of whether you're going to heaven or hell. I'm just a messenger. Do you really believe that it's a fearful thing to fall into the hands of the living God? I do. I do. Father, I've told them what you gave me to tell them. I've delivered your word. I've got peace now. I can rest. Lord, you know I don't like this. But it's not a matter of whether I like it or not. It's your word. It's your word. And it's got to be preached. I gave them what you gave me. Now, Heavenly Father, it's in their hands. What are they going to do with it? I showed them plainly in the Bible how that Sheol and a physical grave are two entirely different things. I showed them in the Bible how the Lord Jesus Christ, your son, was the greatest preacher on hell that ever lived on this earth. I pray now in Jesus' name for his sake. Amen. Say, preacher, I don't want to go to hell. I don't care what anybody thinks. 
I don't care if the crowd that I run with will accept me or reject me. But I don't want to go to hell. But you're smart. You're smart. <laughs> Man stood out there yeah, just a few minutes ago. Just a few minutes ago out in the foyer. He said, I worked with this fellow. He's 42 years old. I worked with him. Next day he was dead. 42. I worked with him Friday, Thursday or Friday. Next day he's dead. So what happened to him? He had an aneurysm. The aorta just exploded. That'll do it. That'll take you out of here fast. Well, what kind of warning did he get? No warning. Felt good one day. He's on a job working. Next day, he's gone. Just like that. Where'd he go? Well, I hope he went to heaven. I don't know the folks. I hope he did. But what if he didn't? What if he woke up to the greatest shock in his life? He woke up in hell. Let's stand up, brother. What do you got? Page 376.